Hey guys, David Acosta here with Achilles Heel Tactical. Uh, today we are in North Richland Hills, Texas. We are at the Gritter Sports Shooting Complex and we will be talking and discussing about everyday carry and defensive pistol. So um, one of the things specifically that comes up in classes all the time when we're teaching classes relevant to uh, concealed carry, what we call defensive pistol, uh, we get classes, uh, questions in classes regarding gear. And in almost every class, we kind of have to do a tabletop discussion, uh, kind of show your kit, if you will, just to provide students with an understanding of what good equipment looks like uh, relative to specific paradigms. So uh, we have to talk about the intent, uh, understand the content, and then make it specif specifically relevant, contextually speaking, so that we understand the contextual appropriateness of what we're saying we advocate for or against. All right, so uh, normally what I generally start off with is discussing clothing. And it's not from the perspective of trying to get guys to wear a certain thing from a fashion perspective. Uh, I don't care what anybody does, what anybody wears, what you think right looks like. I'm simply providing my opinion uh, to those who have asked uh, on an obviously broader spectrum using this platform. So with that being said, uh, the, cl the question always, like for classes, always comes down to like, hey, what pistol? We have to back up prior to that, right? Like, let's think about a myriad of questions if we're saying, like, this is practical for the use of defense uh, in human life, right? Like, defense of human life. So I always tell dudes, like, hey, like, let's think about the universals. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And if you think about those things and systematically progress through each of those questions, we can kind of determine what logically and reasonably makes sense. So if you're saying you carry tools, specifically pistols, blades, etc., for the purpose of defending human life righteously, right? Whether you're a first responder or uh, just a, a good standing American that's ready to be prepared to defend themselves in a random act of violence, um, we need to like look at what that looks like. So I always start off with clothing, right? So when we look at clothing from a principle-based approach, like does your clothing first and foremost provide protection from the elements? Something as simple as that. Does your uh, clothing provide a degree of identification and communication? Right, so if I'm wearing certain clothes that don't match the baseline of the uh, environment or the venue that I'm going to, I become a potential anomaly. So I may be drawing unwanted attention. Now, does that unwanted attention identify me as a good guy or a bad guy? That's completely subjective. Um, but things to be considered, right? So uh, when I look at clothing, it does the clothing provide me a degree of protection from the elements, first and foremost. Second of all, uh, do I blend in? Does it provide a degree of camouflage in the environment? Do I just blend into the background? Uh, do I look like everyone else? Or does my clothing, the branding, the names, the colors, um, the style of wear, does it all kind of start sending off red flags? And if so, for who? So these are questions that we ask or I tell people maybe ask, um, and I'm asking you these questions with simply the intent of provoking thought. Uh, other aspects of the clothing I'm looking for, like, can I actually fight in this? Like, what kind of a fight am I preparing for in my mind? Um, is it a random act of violence? If so, who is it against, right? Like, what does that fight look like? Uh, who am I going against? Uh, who are going to be uh, the adversaries? Are they formidable? Are they willing uh, to die for their cause? Right? These are questions I have to ask. Are they skilled? Are they more skilled than I am? These are all questions that I ask, and I say, okay, well, if I had to go to that fight uh, unwillingly, right, like I have to fight this fight, what do I want to be wearing? And balance of all these questions that I asked prior to as well. So I like clothes that fit uh, a little on the baggier side that allows me to be mobile and is not restrictive and also helps me conceal um, the tools that I plan on bringing to bear. Base layers are often underrated, like, uh, and you don't have to. I choose to wear a base layer. I like wearing an undershirt so that when I'm wearing tools, it's not rubbing directly against my skin. Uh, I find that it helps keep it easy uh, to conceal and wear throughout the day, uh, draws away moisture from the tools, and these are all good things that I, I think have merit in consideration of what we determine we're gonna wear. So first thing I th start off with is clothing. Shoes, socks, I think about it all. Hats, etc. Does it draw attention? Does it protect me? Um, what do I look like? How am I going to per be perceived? So simple as that. Guys, so another thing uh, I take into consideration with, am I wearing armor, right? So whether it's soft armor or hard armor, uh, is my clothing uh, going to help me conceal that armor, right? Like uh, for what we do for work, generally need to go from uh, a covert profile to an overt profile pretty quickly, which means I don't have time to don plates. Generally need to have that on in case I need to 
get to where I need to get to expediently and don't have time to grab uh, extra gear, right? Just have to go with what I have on me. So one of the things I consider is like, is that clothing going to help hide and conceal these things? And then on top of that, is there another garment that I could potentially wear on top to help break up that outline and also help conceal that? So again, having that clothing fit a little bit baggier, but not so baggy that it's obvious you're trying to hide stuff is, is a happy balance that we're trying to, you know, contend with on a regular basis. Going away from clothing, uh, we go now into belts, right? Belts are super important. I see dudes come to classes with belts and they're just not ideal, right? So they're either uh, too loose or too rigid and it just doesn't provide what we want a good belt to do. So a good belt should uh, hold our gear in place without sliding all over the place, right? So depending on what we're carrying, we want that belt to be the chassis of our system, if you will, and it's basically holding all of our gear. So when I look for in a good belt, and I've ran a myriad of them, I've put several out here today, kind of discuss these are the ones that I've worn and continue to wear uh, and cycle through my system, if you will. So, uh, super low pro, we have this Tenacore Zero. Uh, it's super minimalistic, right? I don't think it gets any more minimalistic than this. Easy to get on and off. Uh, nothing bad to say about it. This is the Agonic. Um, super minimalistic, however, a little, uh, a little more intricate, right? So this is intended to keep uh, the pistol where we want it and uh, provide a degree of rigidity wherever the pistol goes. So you gotta slide that on, it becomes a little more work. It does have a stretchy material and is super uh, adaptable, right? Like I can go through the different loops here all the way through. You can cut off the tail if you need to. Um, it's a good system. Uh, I don't, I am constantly going back and forth with uh, modulation. Sometimes I need to go from covert to overt quickly because of my day job. Uh, with that in mind, I have to sometimes expand and contract the belt. This is not super fast to do, uh, nor have I found this to be super fast to do either uh, in consideration of that, which is why I prefer and like personally the ratcheting style belts. This is the next belt. I'm not dogging any of these. Like not everybody faces that paradigm. I do. So these are things that I consider. This is the next belt. It's a ratcheting system. Super easy to get on and off. Uh, to release and to adapt to go inside and outside. So that's what I uh, was wearing for a while. And then progress on to the Blackbeard. The Blackbeard is what I wear every single day, day in, day out. Um, I've been doing that for over a year now. Uh, it's a ratcheting system. The buckle is as minimalistic on a ratcheting system as I've seen so far. Uh, my ability to go uh, and contract and expand the belt for taking stuff on or off and changing out garments uh, is second to none. It's lightning fast, super easy to do on the fly, and I don't have to take my tools off to do it. So I really do like that. Uh, but again, I have a, a little bit of a different take on it because of uh, what I do for work. All right, guys. So when we look at uh, overall preparedness from a broad spectrum, if we said, hey, like you can only have one tool with you for an emergency preparedness scenario, um, most people will default to saying a cutting tool. And the reason for that is generally speaking, like for thousands of years, uh, the cutting tool has been the number one uh, tool that we use uh, for preparedness. It's the hardest tool to fashion off the landscape well. And it's the uh, one tool that actually gets us all the others. Like it helps you procure all the other things. When we talk about protection, uh, we're essentially looking at a cutting tool when we select the pistol. If we define a cutting tool as anything that's going to puncture, perforate, penetrate, separate, or lacerate, a, pr uh, a pistol essentially does that uh, at extended distances, okay? So um, when we look at pistols, what we generally see is, and what I see in classes, is dudes will go one of the spectrum or not, right? Like we see a lot of guys that are like, hey, I am going for ultra concealability. So they run around with the micro pistol. Um, and then you got guys on the other end that's like, nope, I want maximum capability. And they run with a full size, uh, you know, competition setup. So I don't care what you do. I'm just saying that, uh, I'm going to say what I think right looks like, and then I'm going to ask questions with the intent of provoking thought. So I would ask the question, like if you knew for a fact, 100% chance you're going to go, uh, at some point in time today, somebody's going to try to kill you. Um, which pistol would you want to have on you that day, right? Would it be the micro or would it be the ultra, you know, competition pistol, right? Super heavy, super large capacity, um, massive dot, et cetera. What I would say is find a happy balance, right? Like for me, what a happy balance looks like is a compact pistol. Um, 
when we start talking about compact size, the reason I reference a compact is because my hands fit on the pistol well. It's not too small. I can still get a good grip. Uh, I can hide the pistol or conceal the pistol well where it's concealable but still readily accessible. It's not so concealed that I can't access it quickly. Um, and it's yieldable, right? So I can shoot it well uh, when I compare it against a full size and definitely better than uh, the alternative, right? So I'm going into subcompacts and then uh, micro compacts and micro pistols. What looks good on a pistol, right? Like I think a lot of people first and foremost put the emphasis on the pistol and then forget to think about holsters, right? So let's talk about the holster first because that's what carries the actual pistol. Um, when we start looking at holsters, there's a myriad here. We've got some black points and some tentacores. Um, I like both. Um, this is uh, what I'm carrying every single day. It's just a black point dual point 2.0. It's got a dual clip by DCC, adjustable retention. It's got this cami device here that kind of pushes the, the belt out a little bit away from the body. Um, it doesn't have a built-in wedge. I don't like the built-in wedges. What I like to do is just add some soft Velcro on the backside, and then I'll take one of these soft wedges and attach it, right? That just gives me a little more modularity. I can flex and flow how I want or need. I can take it off or put it on depending on what I have going on uh, and whether or not I want to wear it. So I don't like having it dedicated necessarily, although there are some that make it with that. Um, so we need to think about the holster. We need to think about the ride height, like being able to adjust the ride height, being able to adjust cant if necessary. Um, the modularity of the system is super important uh, to make it specific to you individually. But one of the most important things and the most important thing is that it obviously secures the pistol when it's on my person and then makes it uh, you know, readily accessible. So that's important uh, in that regard. Going into the pistol. Once you select the pistol, if we're saying we're carrying it with the, you, or with the intent of using it in defense of human life, uh, again, go back to the five W's and the one H, uh, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Like, think about your paradigm. How's this fight going to happen, right? When's this fight going to happen? Where's this fight going to happen? Who's the opposition? What does that look like? Um, if you're running a pistol nowadays, like 2024, like there's no reason not to have a dot. When it comes down to dots, you got guys with closed emitters and open. I've carried closed emitters like forever, uh, and there's nothing wrong with them. I found them to be smaller, generally speaking. It's a smaller window, and it makes it a little more difficult for my eyes to pick up the dot. On a larger window like this 507C, I can pick up the dot much faster. I see much easier, and I'm not struggling to look for the dot, right? So it allows me to remain a little more target focused with a greater sense of ease than the closed emitters. However, having said that, if I was wearing a pistol overtly uh, as a as a police officer or whatever else have you, a security guard, um, I would want a closed emitter depending on where I live, right? Like, I don't want water getting inside there. That gets weird, uh, especially when you're carrying it day in, day out for, you know, 16 hours a day, five, six days a week, right? So if it was a duty thing like that where I'm carrying it overtly, I would prefer a closed emitter. Uh, for me, carrying concealed on a day-to-day -day, uh, for my job and then off-duty, uh, what I would say is, I have my garments concealing it and providing that protection, right? So uh, just, again, looking at probability versus possibility, I don't mind running this, uh, that open emitter. Next thing I would say is obviously a set of backup iron sights. They don't cost you much, and I like having it. You know, Murphy's Law, whatever can go, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So I like having a set of backup iron sights in case that the dot goes down um, for whatever reason. Generally doesn't happen, but, you know, you can almost... Guarantee on game day, it would, right? It's Murphy's Law. Uh, the light, I'm a huge advocate of having a light uh, just from an everyday career perspective. It acts as a form of navigation, communication, identification, all those things. But also, uh, that light that I have as a handheld needs to be separate than uh, my pistol light. The reason I say I don't, I don't mind having a pistol light on the holster or on the pistol is because the holster matches it, so it coincides. I don't mind the added retail space. Uh, it's a little less comfortable. Um, but comforting, right? Knowing that I have that capability. Uh, I definitely shoot better with two hands on the gun versus one hand with a light and one hand on the gun in any of those different styles. Uh, if we put it on a clock, on a shot timer, uh, you can't compare the two, right? Like I shoot much faster, more accurate with the light attached to the pistol. So I like the idea of having it on there. That's just me, right? Um, so you can see like pistol wise, like they're all set up that way. If for whatever reason I have to digress and, and go towards a higher degree of uh, concealability, uh, concealability, and then you know minimalist, minimalistic in, uh, approach. Then I would go down to a micro pistol, just being aware of like what does that skill set look like, right? Like what happens to my ability to blend speed and accuracy or balance speed and accuracy with a smaller uh, statured setup. So, 
Again, not changing much on the holster. Uh, pistol mags, when I run the pistol on my actual person, I prefer just the standard capacity magazine that keeps the actual profile of the pistol as small as possible. Um, carrying positions wise, uh, I generally carry at one of two positions. If I'm working and running body armor, then I'm running the pistol in this at three o'clock, which is a black point. Just set up for me to be able to run it at three o'clock. Makes it super easy when I'm wearing body armor. Anything in the appendix line becomes difficult to access wearing armor, whether it's soft or hard plates. So, uh, as far as positioning, if I'm wearing it in the appendix position, it makes it very difficult to conceal that, right? That just sticks out in the shirt and makes it really easy to see. This makes it a little easier to conceal um, and ma maintains a minimalistic profile. So that's what I prefer when I'm running it in the waistband or even on my person uh, if I don't have garments that are going to specifically cover it, right? If I have larger garments, I can get away with more. So depending on the garments, depending on what I'm wearing, what I'm doing, where I'm going, what I'm doing there, uh, all that is kind of determined by what that looks like. I generally try to prioritize my capability and capacity over uh, what I'm perceived as when it comes to fashion, right? Um, if I'm carrying a pistol, do I always carry a spare magazine? No, I don't always carry a spare magazine. Um, again, that's one of those things where I'm just looking at probability, possibility, asking myself five W's, one H, and then asking myself, like, is it practical? Is it probable? Uh, does it make sense? Uh, if I am going to carry a spare magazine, I generally will plus up that magazine. I'll add extended base pads uh, that just increase the overall um, capacity of the magazine as a whole, uh, because at this point, it's just a matter of hiding it. Once the guns come out, and if I have to do a reload, that's obviously a bad situation, um, so I don't mind uh, you know, the extended profile. Um, when we start talking about pistols, guys always ask, like, hey, what rounds do you carry? I'm a fan of the jacketed hollow points. Uh, these are great. These are made by Hops. These are 124 grain and 147 grain. My all-time favorite, though, is the Honey Badger by Black Hills Ammunition. It's a 100 grain Honey Badger. It's a solid copper, and uh, the performance on that thing is significant. So, um, again, just think about who you are, where you're getting into this, and make the determination for yourself as far as which one is most contextually appropriate for you. So, getting into the next topic. Uh, blades do a phenomenal job of augmenting pistols, right? We're saying we're carrying these things with the intent of being prepared to defend ourselves or a third party, uh, you know, in defense of human life, right? Realistically speaking, understand that this is all lethal force based. Um, blades do a great job of augmenting the pistol. So the blade, for instance, does not need to be reloaded. It doesn't jam. Um, and it's much harder to contend against uh, than the pistol at extreme close ranges. Right, extreme close ranges, it's not difficult, right, necessarily. You don't get, uh, this. like this is helpful. Extreme close range, it really helps me to grab the pistol here, induce a jam, control the muzzle, make sure that it's tip off, right? Um, that's difficult to do with a blade, right? Like you're not grabbing that, okay? So just, again, surface level here, just talking about why, right? So um, what I think right looks like is uh, for the blade being a cutting tool, wearing it on a day-to-day, -day, I wear two blades, right, essentially. And one is specifically for using in defense of human life, and the other is specifically for utilitarian purposes, right? So the main blade that I wear on my belt line, offset of my pistol, uh, is generally um, a five-inch blade used in a reverse grip draw, and this is what uh, I've come up with as feeling that right looks like for me. This is my blade to my design, my specs, um, and that's what I think right looks like for me. Having said that, all these blades on the table are all Sayoc inspired, Atienza inspired, um, and specifically uh, developed, designed to be used in defense of human life. So having said that, what I think right looks like really does come from my training and exposure in Sayoc Kali, and I'll share some of that with you here today. So when we look at blade design, we look at the myriad of shapes, right? So we can look at different shapes and see what those look like in either a forward grip or a reverse grip and see which is most conducive for what, right? We can see a myriad of sizes, right? The different sizes of the blade, obviously the shapes, the geometry, the length, all that comes into uh, the consideration and understanding of what right looks like from a grip's perspective as well as, right, from the understanding of what the blade's primary intended use is for. 
Is it a slashing blade? Is it a thrusting blade? We, these are things that we take into consideration, right? Um, the thickness of the scales, right? The geometry of the scales, the thickness of the scales, all that is done in consideration of what's going to work well in my hand, right? And then what's it going to cause on the other end? So how wielding is it, right? How easy is it for me to wield? And then also in consideration of what grips does it accompany or accommodate, I should say. And then in relation to that, understanding what's it going to cause on the other end, right? So at, at face value, if you and I had to fight with what you're allowed one of these blades, I'm allowed one of these blades, um, generally nobody goes for the smallest blade they can find, right? Like it's generally like, hey, I'm gonna grab the bigger one on the table because I don't want my opposition to have that larger one. Same thing when we talk about it with pistols. If you and I had to go at it, you get a pistol, I get a pistol, almost nobody goes for the micro pistol, right? Everybody wants the larger one on the table or the more wielding one on the table. It has a greater capability and a greater capacity. So these are things to be considered of. If I'm using a blade or intend on using a blade in defense of human life, what do I want that blade to really look like, right? Um, understanding simple things as far as wound channels, right? So if I took something like this, a smaller blade, and I enter the medium, what does this wound channel look like, right? in consideration of doing that against this wound channel. What does that look like, right? So we can see, obviously, if I'm using it with the intent of defending myself, um, I need it to do what it needs to do, which is help me turn people off faster, right? I'm trying to minimize uh, exposure to that threat for any second longer than I need to, and I'm essentially looking to neutralize that threat as quickly as possible. Whether threat neutralization comes down to uh, understanding like, hey, their desire and also their ability, right? Once it comes down to actually using violence and employing it, uh, the time to affect people's desire kind of goes out the window. Uh, now we're just really trying to maximize and affect their overall ability to continue that fight, so. All right, so getting into secondary blades. Uh, secondary blade, primary focus for me is more for utilitarian purposes. Uh, what I generally uh, go to on a day to day is either uh, Swiss Army knife, um, I can pull this out in public, right, for little minor chores, and it generally doesn't raise alarm, right? Like, nobody looks at you crazy. Uh, when I start drawing stuff like this out, like for utilitarian purposes, uh, obviously it's not its intended design, but people look at you crazy. So, uh, the Northman, uh, made by Amtac Blades, is kind of my go-to for that. I carry it in the pocket, and I'll actually carry it in conjunction with, if I have the space and it makes sense, with a uh, Swiss Army knife. But the way we run this is just essentially here, I'll run it right in the pocket, nice and easy, right? If my hands are staged in my pocket, I can have a staged draw. Uh, if I really had to get to it, it's easy to you know, produce fairly well, especially in a forward grip. So it's a, a pocket knife that doesn't fold, essentially, right? So that's that. Uh, Swiss Army knife, like this is strictly for utility, uh, utility purposes. Um, any of these blades that are smaller in this style can obviously be, uh, a smaller blade can always be carried in the pocket just need be, needs to be reformatted with a, an appropriate sheath. So um, that's what right looks like to me uh, in regards to carrying blades and actual cutting tools. A main blade designated for uh, use in defense of human life, a utility blade that I know I'm gonna be using for utility purposes 90% of the time, but also it's good to have it have uh, an actual functional capability in case I had to actually fight with it. All right, so moving on, I think as a responsibly armed citizen, it makes sense that if I'm carrying tools that are gonna to puncture, perforate, penetrate, separate, lacerate, to carry things that are also going to help support the mitigation of the very things that that causes. So I'm a fan of these two tourniquets. This is just what I go to. Uh, I'm not sponsored by any of them. Uh, I just like both. So this is a, a ratchet-based system. This is the Rapid Stop made by Aero Healthcare. It has a quick detach. It folds really quick, and it's a lightning fast setup. Uh, obviously a little bigger, a little bulky, not intended for concealment. Uh, however, it can be done if you care to do that, <clears throat> if you're committed to do that. Uh, this is much easier to conceal. This is the Snake Staff Systems um, EDC tourniquet. This folds into a mic uh, really small, compact setup, really great setup, super small, minimalistic. Um, it is not a ratchet-based system. It is a windlass-based system, uh, and I, the way I carry that is in my pocket. I'll just use one of my pocket pouches here, made uh, by High Speed Gear, and I'll just run that in a pocket. So I can run that in this pocket or that pocket. Just makes it super easy to carry. 
doesn't really tell if my, my shirt lifts it's not exposed on the clip here so uh, super easy to carry and uh, if I have it I need it right a lot of guys don't care for carrying a tourniquet I'm not saying you have to I'm just saying I choose to um, I think it makes sense on a myriad of ways in a myriad of ways so lights uh, I'm a huge fan of the surefire stiletto it's one of my favorites. Uh, I've modified it slightly, right? Like I love the fact that it's flat, but I've modified it slightly here, just using a piece of shock cord. And what that allows me to do is stick my finger in there. So by sticking my finger in there, I can open my hands. I have a little more dexterity with my hands. Uh, I don't need to, it folds flat. So if I have it in the pocket, I generally do not use the clip. If I'm using the clip, I'm only putting it on a hat to use as a modified headlamp for utility purposes. Um, I like my lights having an overall length that supersedes the width of my hand, right? Just allows me to strike with either side of the light. Um, I like it flat in that it, uh, I like that it's flat in that it, it hides easily in the pocket. It conceals, doesn't create a lot of bulk. Um, this is really bright. You get a thousand lumens on this thing. It cranks and um, you know, you generally get that same reaction from everybody else. So it has that secondary purpose of being able to, to strike with and also um, you know, when you catch somebody by surprise, like their, their desire to want to look away from the light uh, potentially sets up good scenarios for you. This is a Streamlight. Um, this is the MacroStream USB. It's smaller, about the same size, so it meets the parameters of being outside the width of my hand. Obviously, um, you can use it like you would a roll of nickels, or you can use it to strike with on either side. Um, this is definitely not a thousand. This is closer to 500. And uh, the switchology isn't bad. I like the ability for me to be able to minimize the amount of light, right? I can simply do this, put my finger on there and control the amount of light if I want less light. With the Surefire, it's, uh, it's hot and it gets hot really quickly. Um, so you're more likely to burn your finger doing that uh, than you want. Uh, if this catches by accident in your pocket, uh, be warned. I've melted a couple of cool pants accidentally doing that. So having said that, um, Either of these lights work well. Uh, that's what I look for in a light. I use the light more than probably anything other, anything else aside from uh, my phone. Aside from my, my phone and my wallet, I use my light uh, on a regular basis, whether it's lighting stuff up, getting inside of stuff. Uh, it's very functional and it definitely has purpose. If you think about it, seeing in the dark is a superpower, right? All this stuff gives you superpowers, right? Like being able to turn somebody off at 25 yards, that's a superpower. Right? Being able to do what this does uh, is also a potential superpower. Um, doing, being able to see in the dark and create light, it's a superpower. Right? If we went back 6,000 years ago and pulled out one of these, dudes would be like, what is that? Right? Like, it's a superpower. So, uh, again, light just acts as a form of navigation, communication, and also identification, which are looking at those overall principles uh, for everyday carry. Communication. Uh, Obviously, with my job, having a badge and identifier is important, right? Going from a low-vis perspective to a high-vis perspective uh, matters. Being able to do that quickly, expediently is, is a real thing for me. Uh, it's important. So I carry those things with me. Um, and again, whether I carry, I generally almost always, no, I always carry this. Um, don't always carry this, okay? And it just, it's a little bulkier. If I'm at work, I'm wearing it. It's 100% part of protocol. But when I'm off duty, not really. All right? um, so just something to be considered of. Either of those two forms of communication. Other form of, I'm sorry, identification. Other form of identification, obviously being able to identify yourself, um, saying you, know, you are who you say you are. Carrying all this stuff in a wrong situation can look really bad, obviously. So I want to do everything that I can to make myself uh, as identifiable as a good guy as practical. So uh, having your IDs with you, I think that's important. Uh, irrespective of what you think of laws and all the other things. Uh, so people get weird with that. I would say I want to be able to readily identify myself using licenses and IDs and permits and all those things um, to make it easier on the legal side of the house. Communication wise, uh, it's also like the number one thing I use is obviously this, right? Like in today's day, um, my phone is the number one thing I'm using, whether it's my talking to my wife or communicating with my son via his watch. Uh, or just work stuff. So that's huge. Uh, if from an emergency preparedness perspective, uh, I like the idea of having uh, hands-free communication, meaning like I don't have to hold a phone in my hand. So I'm an advocate for either AirPods or the plug-in. 
Obviously the plug-in, the wiring can get uh, funky depending on what you have going on. But uh, the watches also act in another form of communication identification. It's essentially a watch, I'm sorry, a phone on my hand or on my wrist. Again, uh, in an emergency, I can quickly say, hey, you know her name and tell her to call 911 and she'll do that um, without me having to actually uh, dial any numbers. So it just makes it a little more expedient in that uh, scenario where seconds count. Uh, radio wise, like obviously if you need to wear a radio and having that on a wireless setup is important or a hands-free setup, obviously not wireless, but a hands-free setup. So when we start talking about pouches, uh, pouches, if you think about it, it's just the principle of having a container. Containers are critical for all aspects of survival. If you think about it, we use pa uh, packs and bags and pockets and holsters and sheaths and pouches to make carrying, transporting, all these things uh, easier and maintaining our mobility as a whole. So um, these pouches here are obviously, you know, I'm kind of plugging myself here, but I designed these pouches because of my background, because of this overall perspective and understanding. And I designed them with the intent of making carrying what we need to carry and want to carry much easier. So uh, there's two styles of pouches here. You have essentially pistol style and uh, rifle style. Uh, so pistol mags, rifle mags. Anything that's roughly close to the size or dimensions of a pistol mag or a rifle mag will fit in these pouches, right? So I could fit that radio. I can fit cuffs. I can fit a shorty mag. Orientation doesn't matter. Or a full size mag. Right, so the orientation really doesn't matter on these. Um, it's really the end user's preference. Same thing uh, with the pistol mags, anything roughly pistol size. So whether it's a pistol mag, whether it's double stack, single stack, irrespective of orientation, right? It doesn't matter the size or the orientation. These are single stack micros. Right, like I can go in and out of any one of these. So I wanted to create something that was versatile, modular. Um, clips on all of these, the clips can go up, down, left, right. You can adjust the ride height, the ride cant, and you can switch out the clips to accommodate specific belt sizes, whether it's a 1.5 or 175. You can run pocket clips, right? All these clips are made by discrete carry concepts. Uh, they're the best clips on the market, hands down. Um, and what this allows us to do is carry whatever we think we need on us uh, more easily, right? So anything that fits roughly those sizes will go in there. Tourniquets, lights, whatever. So whatever we need to carry, we can carry fairly easily in these pouches. It just keeps it super modular. Uh, what's cool about these is they fold flat. So once I draw whatever was in it out of it, it's no longer open, right? Like with something made of um, thermal injected plastic like this, once I draw whatever's out of there, uh, leaving it open makes it way easier to put it back in. Um, so with this, obviously uh, not as easy, but still manageable to put stuff back into it, just by using the sweat guard on the backside, put it in, press it out and go. So pouches and containers, uh, they are obviously one of those things that we're often looking at, right? Even to a matter of carrying water, right? So. If you think about it, Yeti's making a lot of money because containers are a matter of purpose. So containers are one of those things like you definitely need, you definitely want. You use them every day, all the time, uh, and probably don't even think about it that way. But containers are important, so I think it's one of those things we should be looking at when we look at all these things. All right, dude, so last but not least, uh, we put as much thought onto the training side as we do all right, the real side. So when we're carrying, selecting all these tools, it's important that we understand that software must precede hardware. A lot of guys have that backwards. A lot of guys will go out and buy all the hardware um, and think that that makes them a professional because they're carrying the same thing that ex-professional said they should carry. Um, that's not the case, right? Like you walking around with a hammer doesn't make you a carpenter. Um, the same way we're driving a Ferrari doesn't make you a race car driver. Um, so when we look at these things like, hey, like let's overemphasize the software, not the hardware. Having said that, we understand that the hardware definitely increases our overall capability our overall capacity, uh, but we can't sacrifice the competency that it takes to actually run these things. So um, if we're carrying blade stuff, we should be training blade stuff. If we're carrying pistols, we should, doing, we should be training pistol stuff, right? Uh, we like uh, advocating for 
having continuity across the board. So if I have my live pistol, I run the exact same thing for my training pistol, as close as I can get to it. So when it's time to go for training, uh, what let's say specifically violence, combatives based, now I just put my training set up into that rig. Same thing with the blade. If I'm training with the blade, uh, I just run the exact same thing and I run that right in the exact same sheet that I carry. If I'm running tourniquets, right, like I bring that, carry that with me when I'm doing my training. Same thing on this side. So I make sure that when I'm training, especially combatives, that my loadout for training is consistent with what I wear on a day-to-day -day basis. That just gives me a little more exposure um, and acts as a way of proofing the very things that I say I think right looks like. This acts as a proofing ground by getting to see, well, does that really feel good there? Like, right? what does it feel like sitting in a car or you know, walking around with it versus actually fighting with it on, versus actually moving around, jumping fences, uh, doing whatever you may have to do come real world, right? So that also acts as a way to you know, shake down gear, proof it as far as where you wanna wear it, the, 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 where, the placement of the position, the setup of the clip, the setup of the belt, the placement on your belt, uh, what clothing, like, hey, I thought these pants were good, they're not. I thought this shirt was conducive for a good draw stroke, it's not. Right? Like, all these things are great things to find out, in training, you don't want to find it out on game day. So we advocate invest in the training, not just going out and getting the training, but then making sure that you're setting up yourself up so when you come to a class, you have it on you. David Acosta, Achilles Heel Tactical, wrapping up our EDC table talk. Uh, again, the intent behind providing this content was simply this, right? Like we have people that often come to classes, they come with inferior equipment, and then we have this discussion in class, and then the feedback was like, hey man, is there a way that you can talk about that beforehand so when I sign up for class, I can invest in quality gear and not have to buy twice. So that was the intent. Uh, stay tuned for more information coming out. Uh, like, subscribe, comment down below.